Mikawa's ships sank four American and Australian heavy cruisers and damaged one cruiser and two destroyers in a 30-minute battle. Mikawa's only loss was cruiser Kako, sunk two days later by submarine S-44 as his ships were nearing Kavieng, New Ireland. Mikawa achieved one of the most brilliant surface victories of the war. He erred, however, in failing to attack any of the supply-laden transports of Guadalcanal. Mikawa has been sharply criticised for this blunder by both Americans and Japanese after the war. It is my belief, however, that Mikawa fulfilled his watchdog assignment. The real blame must rest with Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, who held his combined fleet in home waters. When the American invasion was reported to Japan, the lion pricked its ears, but did not rise. Emperor Hirohito, vacationing at his summer villa in Nikko, upon hearing the news, said he would return to Tokyo immediately. But Admiral Osami Nagano, chief of the naval general staff, went directly to Nikko for an audience. Your Majesty, it is nothing worthy of Your Majesty's attention, Nagano explained. He flashed an intelligence report from the Japanese military attaché in Moscow, claiming that the enemy had only 2,000 troops at Guadalcanal, and that their plan was simply to destroy the airfields and withdraw from the islands. It is not known how this stupid intelligence report was obtained, but even more stupid were the high-ranking officers who must have ignored the many other intelligence reports. Finally, on August 10th, three days after the operation started, the 5,800 Midway troops standing by at Truk were ordered to Guadalcanal by Imperial General Headquarters. The Yamamoto Lion had closed its eyes again after hearing of Mikawa's phenomenal win, and it slowly arose only after learning of the IGHQ order. The next day, August 11th, Vice Admiral Nobutak Kondo's 2nd Fleet was detached from Combined Fleet for the 2,700-mile voyage to Guadalcanal. Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo stalled, saying that his new pilots were not yet ready, but, under prodding, he did have his ships ready to sortie with Yamamoto's main force on August 16th. By that time, American forces were firmly ashore on Guadalcanal. Last-minute changes put my ship, Amatsukaze, under the command of my old friend Nagumo. Amatsukaze and 14 destroyers were assembled into Destroyer Squadron 10 around Cruiser Nagara, Nagumo's flagship since the sinking of Akagi at Midway. The squadron was commanded by Rear Admiral Susumu Kimura, a destroyer expert. We went south at an easy 18 to 20 knots. These destroyers were all capable of 33 knots, but high speed increased fuel consumption tremendously. Our schedule was to reach truck around August 20th, covering 2,000 miles in five days. Thence we would advance to Guadalcanal. Halfway to Truk we learned of another Japanese blunder committed at Guadalcanal. On the night of August 18th, six Japanese destroyers had landed 800 lightly equipped troops on the eastern coast of Guadalcanal. Apparently no one in the Japanese high command realised that the Americans had already poured some 20,000 well-equipped marines into the island. The Japanese troops made a dogged advance through the jungle, only to be trapped two days later by the Americans in a mass slaughter. Fewer than 200 Japanese survived the onslaught, and they fled in utter disorder. The news shook Yamamoto. He immediately called off the scheduled stopover at Truk and ordered the fleet to rush directly to Guadalcanal. Belatedly, Yamamoto had come to his senses, but the army command clung to the myth that the invincible Japanese could shatter outnumbering enemy forces by their aggressive spirit. After the collapse of Colonel Kiyonao Ichiki's 1st Regiment, the army decided this time to throw in a brigade. This force, commanded by Major General Saiken Kawaguchi, was also defeated, but it was still a long time before the army could decide to put a full division into the effort. Yamamoto's complacency was completely shaken on August 20th. That morning, a patrol plane searching about 500 miles west of Bougainville had sighted an enemy task force at least one carrier, one cruiser, and two destroyers heading north at 14 knots. Yamamoto had cancelled the stop at Truk, but practically all ships were low on fuel. We had to refuel at sea from tankers before continuing our advance. Refueling at sea is always a hazardous and nerve-wracking operation, especially so in time of war. 
Both tanker and warship must slow to six knots, and several destroyers must patrol lest enemy subs or planes attack this tempting target. On this occasion, our refueling took so long that it was four on the 23rd before we arrived in position 400 miles north of Guadalcanal. Two transports carrying another 1,500 troops under Colonel Ichiki, escorted by one cruiser and six destroyers of Destroyer Squadron 2, were 50 miles ahead of us. The plan was for half of Ichiki's vanguard troops to assault Guadalcanal, followed by the other half after the first force had been landed. Additional support troops would be provided by the Kawaguchi Brigade, whose convoy had left from Truk. On the morning of August 23rd, Destroyer Squadron 2 reported that its ships had been spotted by enemy patrol planes, and Admiral Yamamoto was thus confronted with a problem. The most appropriate solution would have been to cancel the scheduled landing operations and engage in a decisive naval action. Yamamoto, however, ordered Destroyer Squadron 2 convoy with its Ichiki troops to reverse course, just for a day, and he gave no orders to the Kawaguchi convoy. He had decided to knock out the small American task force and then continue with the scheduled landing operation. Some explanations are required here to explain Yamamoto's decision, bearing in mind that hindsight judgments can never appreciate the burdens of an on-the-spot decision. Since the China War, it had been traditional for the Army to take the initiative and the Navy to follow suit. It was the Army's idea to land a battalion first, then the remainder of the regiment and then a brigade. To demand that the Army revamp this idea would have been to break with tradition. If Yamamoto had known the strength of the enemy on Guadalcanal, he would undoubtedly have taken the bold step and ignored the tradition. But somehow the facts of the situation failed to reach him. His prime concern was for the troops holding a beachhead on the east coast of Guadalcanal. Their annihilation seemed to be only a matter of time. Something had to be done to prevent the loss of this beachhead. Yamamoto hastily formed a diversionary force of 10150-ton Ryujo, the smallest combined fleet carrier, heavy cruiser tone, and destroyers Tokitsukaze and Amatsukaze. This four-ship unit, led by Rear Admiral Chuichi Hara, was to storm Guadalcanal and draw off the American task force reported heading toward Bougainville. The Nagumo task force, with its nucleus of two 40,000-ton carriers, was directed to turn northeastward and flank the enemy ships as they pursued Admiral Hara's decoy force. We set off at two on the 24th with 13,320-ton tone, a weird-looking ship with all of its eight six-inch main guns mounted on the bow deck in the lead. Ryujo followed, flanked by Amatsukaze to starboard, and our sister ship Tokitsukaze to port. We dashed toward Guadalcanal at 26 knots. The assignment was not an easy one, but it was my first really important mission of the war. My muscles twitched with excitement as I stood on the bridge. Admiral Hara, in tone, was one of the Navy's most brilliant leaders. I had known him since my academy days when he had been an instructor, and I had full trust in him. Hara had led one carrier division of the Nagumo task force when it hit Pearl Harbor. The big concern was Ryujo. Whenever I looked at this ten-year-old carrier I got uneasy. The best pilots were never assigned to older ships, and after losing so many crack flyers at Midway, I was positive that Ryujo's aviators were sadly inexperienced. I brooded over how this decoy would survive its first acid test in the war. At 7.13, as day dawned on the South Pacific Ocean, the first enemy contact was made with a Navy float plane. It followed us for many miles, but finally turned away, evidently with enough information about our strength. I groaned. We went ahead according to schedule for four uneasy hours without sight of any more enemy planes. The sea was extremely calm. The sun shone intermittently through thick clouds. The weather, favourable for attacking aircraft, recalled memories of Midway. What a bad day, I thought. At eleven we were two hundred miles north of Guadalcanal. Six bombers and fifteen fighters zoomed up from Ryujo and headed for the island exactly on schedule. When Ryujo turned westward toward its rendezvous with these planes, my ship swung to port, keeping two thousand metres from the carrier. I knew that the twenty-one planes sent off were not the ship's full complement, and wondered why Ryujo did not fly its nine remaining fighters as air cover. Looking at the cloud banks, I speculated on how enemy planes might spill out of them at any moment to deal a fatal blow at the vulnerable carrier, just as at midway. 
Gradually, I became more and more irritated. Another hour passed, and still no more fighters from Ryujo. I simply could not understand it, and mumbled angrily to myself. At 12.30, the tube from the radio room brought an excited voice. Commander, a message from a Ryujo plane says that the Guadalcanal bombing was successful. I sighed in relief, but wondered just how effective only six bombers could be. I started to eat lunch, which had been brought to me on the bridge. I had just finished eating when I heard one of the lookouts call, A plane, looks like the enemy, coming from 30 degrees to port. Through binoculars I saw an enemy plane rambling leisurely in the distance, slipping in and out of the clouds. Signal flags went up, ship whistles blew, and guns were raised for anti-aircraft firing. As the plane approached, another emerged from the clouds. They appeared to be B-17 flying fortresses, like our old friends at Davao. I turned toward Ryujo and stared open-mouthed. All was so quiet and serene on board the carrier that I thought the skipper must be asleep. To alert Ryujo, I told my gunners to open fire, although the enemy bombers were still out of range. Tone and Tokitsukaze immediately followed suit. At last, two fighters zoomed up from Ryujo. The enemy planes turned tail, their reconnaissance completed. Our fighters climbed rapidly, but when they reached the enemy altitude, the B-17S had vanished into the clouds. The fighters came back and circled slowly over their carrier. My patience ended. I was worried and furious. Ryujo would be helpless against enemy planes which might appear in strength at any moment. I jotted a note and called my signal officer. Send this message to Ryujo by semaphore at once. A signalman ran up and briskly waved his flags. To Commander Hisakichi Kishi, Ryujo, fully realising my impertinence, am forced to advise you my impression. Your flight operations are far short of expectations. What is the matter? The message was probably rude and certainly audacious. I don't know of any other Japanese naval officer who sent such a message during an operation. I addressed the message to Kishi because we had been classmates at Etajima. He was not responsible for flight operations, but my intention was to awaken the skipper and flight officer who were responsible. Wondering what Kishi's reaction would be, I stared at the carrier and saw an answering signal. Deeply appreciate your admonition. We shall do better and count on your cooperation. Ryujo's action response was prompt. Seven more fighters quickly appeared on deck. Their propellers went into action almost instantly, but they were too late, for at that moment my lookouts shouted, many enemy planes approaching. It was about 14, and Ryujo was turning into the wind to launch aircraft when scores of American dive bombers attacked. I watched Ryujo anxiously. Other Japanese carriers could clear their decks of readied fighters in a matter of a few minutes, but not Ryujo. I had many other things to do. My ship was moving out to a 5000 meter distance from Ryujo, just as were Tone and Tokitsukaze to fight the oncoming enemy planes. Ryujo radioed the 21 planes which had struck Guadalcanal, ordering them to go to Buka, midway between Rabaul and Guadalcanal, instead of returning to the carrier. Why didn't it call back some of these 15 fighters for interception? I had no more time to speculate. The enemy SBD Dauntless bombers and Grumman fighters were pouncing on the sluggish carrier. At least two dozen American bombers spilled their deadly charges around Ryujo, and fighters swooped low over the ship, machine gunning everything in sight. Ryujo's 12 anti-aircraft guns fired sporadically without downing any of the attackers. Two or three enemy bombs hit the ship near the stern, piercing the flight deck. Scarlet flames shot up from the holes. Ominous explosions followed in rapid order. Several more bombs made direct hits. Water pillars surrounded the carrier, and it was engulfed in thick black smoke. This was no deliberate smoke screen. Her fuel tanks had been hit and set afire. Was she sinking? Had she sunk? The enemy planes now turned from the carrier and headed against the other three of us. All guns opened fire as the planes swooped on us. My ship was making 33 knots and zigzagging frantically. Tremendous bow waves kicked up by the speeding destroyer drenched me on the bridge. Amatsukaze weathered the 30-minute attack. Some of the bombers had saved their eggs for us. None hit my ship, but there were several near misses. I breathed deeply as the enemy planes pulled away. Now I turned my eyes in the direction of Ryujo. The black smoke was beginning to dissipate, and the carrier emerged. 
Through binoculars I could see that Ryujo, in her death throes, had stopped all forward motion and was sinking. A heavy starboard list exposed her red belly. Waves washed her flight deck. It was a pathetic sight. Ryujo, no longer resembling a ship, was a huge stove, full of holes which belched eerie red flames. Flagship tones signalled, Destroyers, stand by Ryujo for rescue operation. My ship immediately dashed toward the sinking carrier, but we were delayed when three planes appeared suddenly out of the clouds, causing general alarm. As they neared, they were identified as returning Zero fighters. They circled slowly over their sinking home, as if bidding it farewell. One of them came down slowly near my ship, trying to ditch. Amatsukaze obligingly slowed down. The other two planes ditched alongside Takitsukaze. The three pilots were quickly rescued, but nothing could be done to save their planes. Precious time was lost in this rescue work. It seemed to me Ryujo would sink at any moment. But the burning carrier, despite its many gaping holes, miraculously stayed afloat. Even the eerie flames spurting from the hull subsided possibly because of the thousands of tons of seawater flowing into her. Our hopes rose as Amatsukaze rushed to Ryujo's side. I recalled miraculous cases of effective damage control, which enabled badly crippled ships to limp back for repairs. Our approach to Ryujo, however, was again suspended, this time by two B-17S, which emerged from the clouds. The two destroyers and Tone had to resume speed for a zigzag run. All guns opened fire at the two bombers, which fortunately made only a half-hearted attack. Or perhaps they were simply too inexperienced to aim properly at fast-moving targets on the ocean. All their bombs were wasted. Dusk was approaching as the bombers departed and we resumed rescue operations. Thank God. Ryujo was still afloat but without power. Maybe we could tow her to Truk for repair. My wishful optimism was shattered as we drew near. The fire had gutted everything. All weapons and facilities were destroyed. Bodies were scattered everywhere. The ship was listing some 40 degrees and sinking visibly. Presently a man started waving signal flags which read, We are abandoning ship. Come alongside to rescue crew. We quickly moved in along Ryujo's submerging starboard deck. If the carrier sank as it could at any moment, Amatsukaze might be carried down with it. It was clearly no time for hesitation, and I decided to take a chance. The ocean, which had appeared calm, was actually rolling in long waves, causing the carrier's listing superstructure to pitch and brush frighteningly against the bridge of my little destroyer. Cold sweat ran down my back. Scores of strong seamen armed with long poles ran to the port side of my ship and held us off Ryujo. As long planks were set to link my ship with Ryujo, the wounded were helped and followed by the able-bodied who filed across to our ship, the officers carrying classified documents. The transfer was made very efficiently. More than 300 survivors boarded Amatsukaze. Ryujo's list suddenly increased steeply. It was sinking now. Evacuation finished? I shouted. An officer at the end of the plank nodded and answered, Yes, sir. Please cast off. It's getting dangerous. Amatsukaze's powerful turbines roared into action instantly. The destroyer responded quickly and moved desperately away. We had gone scarcely 500 metres when Ryujo disappeared among the waves. The tremendous whirlpool caused by its sinking made Amatsukaze bob like a cork. It was a close shave indeed. I was still breathing hard when a low voice behind me said, Commander, I... I do not know how to thank you. I turned around and saw Captain Tadao Kato of Ryujo, the last man in the evacuation line. This was the man I had cursed so many times only a few hours ago. Kato, haggard and pathetic, bowed to me and croaked, Please accept my humble thanks on behalf of my men. Suddenly I felt sorry for this general line officer, not a specialist, and my anger switched abruptly to Admiral Yamamoto who had chosen such a man for a decoy mission. You need not thank me, Captain Kato, I replied curtly. You look ill. Are you hurt? No, not a bit. But so many of my men were lost, and the ship... Hands to face, he sobbed, no longer able to control himself. I feared he might collapse and called, Orderly, quick, take Captain Kato to my cabin. Oh no, Kato protested. Let me stay with my men, any place that won't bother your operation. I let him do as he pleased, since every inch of my ship was jammed with the rescued crew of Ryujo. 
I pitied the old captain as he trudged toward the ladder. Captain Cato, I called. Just a moment. May I ask if my good friend Kishi, your exec, is safe? Cato turned back speechless, his haggard face wrinkled with the pain of sorrow. I understood and nodded. Cato lowered his head and went below. I was stunned. My friend Kishi was dead. Kishi had a brilliant record as an aviation specialist. Had he been given a free hand by this line skipper from the beginning, things might have turned out better. I shook my head. There was still important work to be done. Morning had to wait until duties were completed. My ship joined Tokitsukaze and flagship tone, and I was elated to find them unscathed like mine. They were still busy picking up some Ryujo crewmen who had jumped overboard. Meanwhile, 14 Ryujo planes returned from the strike on Guadalcanal and circled overhead. Seven, including the only radio-equipped one of the flight, were lost. The remainder, accordingly, did not know they had been ordered to land at Buka. They had to ditch, and our three ships picked up the crews, but all the planes sank. The sun was setting as Tone, Tokitsukaze and Amatsukaze started eastward under orders from Nagumo to join his main task force. This day of the Battle of the Eastern Solomons, August 24, 1942, had been a long one for me, and it was not yet over. After cruising some 50 miles toward our scheduled rendezvous, we observed a group of Japanese warships moving slowly to the south with their searchlights blazing. They were searching for pilots who had been forced to ditch. The night was black as pitch, the bombs and guns had been silent for hours, and I was beginning to feel the accumulated fatigue of a day-long battle following a sleepless night when these ships were sighted. I was thinking it would be good now to have a short nap when my signal officer reported that flagship Shokaku was blinking a signal to Amatsukaze. Admiral Nagumo directs Commander Hara to rescue two Zuikaku pilots adrift. Proceed at once to position KEN-21. I replied immediately. From Commander to Admiral Nagumo, Amatsukaze will proceed at once to KEN-21 and rescue Zuikaku's pilots. Turning to the charts, I checked the indicated grid position and whistled. KIN-21 was 98 miles almost due south of our present position, and it was within 60 miles of the enemy task force position as reported at the time of Ryujo's sinking. But orders were orders, and this was no time for hesitation. My drowsiness vanished and I summoned my staff for consultation. We could not afford to be off course by the slightest bit in this mission. I had no idea how the position of the pilots had been determined, but knew that our slim chance of rescuing them would be greatly reduced if there was any error in navigation. Admiral Nagumo had been so good to me that, knowing he had chosen me especially for this mission, I was determined to live up to his expectations. We were approaching what might well be the jaws of the lion, but my men were willing and eager, and I was with them. Four hours of running at 24 knots put us in the approximate area. I slowed Amatsukaze to six knots. With no stars visible, a sextant was of no use, so we had to rely on dead reckoning. When Ensign Hideo Shoji reported that we were in the designated grid position, I called all spare crewmen to stand lookout, announcing that whoever discovered the first clue leading to rescue of Zuikaku's pilots would be rewarded. The men ran enthusiastically to positions of vantage around the ship. Since there were Japanese pilots down in this vicinity, I had to assume that enemy pilots might also have ditched here, and that they were also being looked for. Accordingly, I could not allow the use of searchlights which might draw attention to our position. Our destroyer, snailing along at six knots, was as vulnerable to submarine attack as an old transport. After half an hour of fruitless searching, I became concerned about our fuel supply. In addition to all the other factors that had to be considered, Amatsukaze had used much fuel in its decoy mission with Ryujo, and we still needed enough to reach Rabaul, 500 miles away. With this in mind, I ordered small running lights placed on the sideboards. Within minutes, a sailor in the bow sang out, Floating object to starboard. Looks like a bottle. I leaned from the bridge railing, saw the pop bottle reflecting the green running light and shouted, Good! They must be nearby! Cheered by this turn, I ordered a weak signal light from the bridge to blink the name of the pilot's ship. Zuikaku! Zuikaku! Another half-hour passed and hope was waning when out of the darkness I saw a flick of a light off the port bow. It flickered again, some thousand metres distant, and went out, but this time I was sure. 
Turning in that direction, a boat was lowered from Amatsukaze when we had approached to within 100 meters and saw two men clinging to a raft. Ensign Hideo Shoji commanded the rescue boat. A blue-shaded light was used to assist the operation, and Shoji paused halfway to the raft to report back that the men looked like Americans. I grabbed binoculars for a close scrutiny. In the blue light, they did look like Americans, but I ordered, Rescue the men, whoever they are. My knees were shaking. If these men were Americans, it meant that our search must continue. But I was resolved to carry out my mission if it meant searching until dawn. As our boat reached the raft, a flashlight blinked that these were the Japanese we sought, and I breathed a sigh of great relief. With the men safely on board, we headed north at 24 knots, and I relaxed in a chair for the first time in many hours. Our rescue mission of the day was a complete success. Our decoy mission, on the other hand, had met a dismal end, and yet it had not been a failure. The sacrifice of Ryujo had deflected the enemy from the main Japanese force and permitted Admiral Nagumo to concentrate his full air strength against Enterprise. Still, the sinking of Ryujo as against the damaging of Enterprise was no advantage for Japan, since the latter carrier survived and was restored to service within two months. Furthermore, the US Navy bombed the Ichiki convoy and damaged cruiser Jinsu, the escort flagship. Six destroyers of the squadron closed Guadalcanal and bombarded it furiously during the night, but B-17S hit back the following morning and raked the ships for several hours. The convoy escaped to Bougainville, but not before destroyer Mutsuki had been sunk and transport Kinryumaru sunk. Learning of the stiff opposition to be expected, the Kawaguchi convoy turned around and went back to Truk. Thus, the whole of this second encounter in the Solomons ended in a Japanese defeat, tactically and strategically. And Yamamoto's decision was proved wrong. Two days after the operation, I heard an Imperial headquarters communique claiming that in the Battle of August 23rd, 25, heavy damage had been inflicted on a large American carrier, medium damage to a medium American carrier and a Pennsylvania-class battleship. The communique admitted to the loss of only one Japanese destroyer sunk and heavy damage to a small carrier. An American announcement said Saratoga's planes had bombed a Japanese carrier and damaged a cruiser and a destroyer. It admitted considerable damage to Enterprise, but went on to say that the Saratoga and Marine planes had also scored hits on a battleship and two cruisers. Ryujo had sunk before my very eyes, but none of the other three ships in our decoy force were even hit. American pilots apparently mistook transport Kinryumaru for a battleship and destroyer Mutsuki for a cruiser. From that day on, I distrusted all war communiques, Japanese or enemy. When Amatsukaze rejoined the Nagumo task force around noon on August 25th, I found new and pleasant orders waiting for me in the form of a message from carrier Shokaku. Admiral Nagumo congratulates Commander Hara for his fine, impressive job and directs him to proceed immediately to Truk and land the rescued persons. Amatsukaze again broke away from the task force and steamed alone to Truk. We reached the calm of that atoll the following day. The great Han dynasty of China was founded by General Liu Pang in 202 BC after he had emerged victorious from a series of many battles in a great civil war. One day, after gaining the throne, Generalissimo Liu was chatting with his chief of staff, General Han Xin. Liu, how do you rate me as a general? Han, I think your majesty can command at most an army of a few divisions. Liu, and what is your own ability? Han, the more armies of as many possible divisions I command, the better I work. Liu, how does it happen that I am an emperor while you remain a general? Han, you are a born leader of leaders. Liu was one of the greatest emperors, and Han one of the greatest generals in history. Few admirals have enjoyed such high reputation as did Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto in World War II. He had great ability, but I feel that his reputation as a naval leader was greater than he deserved. I do not mean to compare Yamamoto categorically with Liu, but in respect of their actual abilities, they are comparable. Despite Japan's miserable defeat in the Pacific War, the nation is still inclined to regard Yamamoto as a hero. Post-war writings have criticised other military and naval leaders, but not Yamamoto. If my remarks on Yamamoto seem severe, it is not that I have any personal feelings against him. This is just the first writing by a Japanese military man to be at all critical of him.
To me, Admiral Yamamoto was a born leader of leaders, and for that he deserved the almost religious respect accorded him. But he was not qualified to command a million tons of ships and their crews. It was tragic that he was chosen to head the combined fleet. Many of my colleagues believe that Yamamoto would have been an ideal Navy minister, and there was a movement underway among certain naval officers to have him named to this post. Their idea was that Admiral Mitsumasa Yonai should command the combined fleet. That move collapsed when Yonai, who strongly opposed war, refused, saying, I am not a fighting admiral, and would only make things worse with the army. Furthermore, if such a stiff-necked man as Yamamoto becomes Navy minister, he will surely be assassinated by army hotheads. The real trouble was the army. When the war began, the cabinet was headed by General Hideki Tojo. Admiral Shigetaro Shimada, the Navy minister, was known to be a Tojo stooge. The Navy chief of staff, Admiral Osami Nagano, was not strong enough to oppose army plans. In criticizing Yamamoto, his actions and inaction, consideration must be given to all these factors which served to hamstring him. Throughout his career, Yamamoto was known to be a superb gambler. He was skilled in all games of chance, especially poker. His decision to attack Pearl Harbor was a gamble which paid tremendous odds. It is strange, therefore, that Yamamoto never again played his cards for all they were worth, as a gambler should. The lessons of the Coral Sea battle were not applied to Midway, where Yamamoto split his forces, to his detriment, between his prime objective and the Aleutians. Yamamoto was undoubtedly preoccupied with preserving his forces. My survivor-laden Amatsukaze entered the quiet of Truk Harbour on the 25th of August, 1942. I fully expected to be ordered back to action as soon as our passengers went ashore. None of us in Amatsukaze imagined that we would stay more than a month at this haven during such a critical period of the war. At Truk, I learned details of the Coral Sea Battle of May 7th 8, which had taken place while I was vacationing at home and subsequent actions. Japan's plans for an amphibious invasion of Port Moresby, a key Allied base on the southern coast of New Guinea, were thwarted as a result of this battle. Light carrier Shoho was sunk, and fleet carriers Shokaku and Zuikaku were so damaged that they could not take part in the Midway battle one month later. Against these losses, the Imperial Navy claimed a victory in having sunk three enemy carriers. The enemy's actual losses in this battle were carrier Lexington, Euler Neosho and destroyer Sims sunk, and carrier Yorktown damaged. There was no doubt that Japan suffered a stunning setback, despite the official claim of victory. One month later, Japan was crushingly defeated at Midway, where she lost carriers Kaga, Akagi, Hiryu and Soryu, and heavy cruiser Mikuma. The US Navy had carrier Yorktown repaired in time for Midway, to Japanese bewilderment, and she was lost in this battle, along with destroyer Hamon. In July, the Japanese High Command committed another blunder in landing an army division at Buna, on the east coast of Papua. The troops were to cross the Owen Stanley Mountains and attack Port Moresby. The entire division perished, more from natural causes, impossible terrain of jungle and mountains, than from enemy attack. It is significant that the Allies started their Guadalcanal invasion on August 7th, just as Japanese forces were committed and bogging down in Papua. Yamamoto blundered in his evaluation of the Papua and Guadalcanal operations. Just as at Midway, he had divided his forces in making a simultaneous attack on the insignificant Aleutians, so with Guadalcanal he was forced to divide his efforts between that island and the Papuan Peninsula. The piecemeal Japanese offensives were ineffective, and the consequent division of forces and effort was disastrous. On the night of August 24th, while Amatsukaze was rescuing the two flyers, Seven destroyers were storming Guadalcanal with little or no result. On the next two days, our planes attacked the island without significant effect, while the mainstay of his combined fleet manoeuvred aimlessly around the Solomons. Yamamoto's irresolution was becoming apparent. Four days later, the Ichiki convoy tried again for Guadalcanal. Escorting destroyer Division 20 took the brunt of Allied air attacks in which Asagiri was sunk, and the other three destroyers, Shirakumo, Yugiri, Amagiri, were damaged. Yamamoto belatedly sent 30 fighters and three bombers from carriers Shokaku and Zuikaku to assist, but they arrived after the convoy had been forced to turn back to the shortlands. 
Meanwhile, on a forlorn corner of Guadalcanal, the decimated vanguard unit of the Ichiki Regiment cried for reinforcement. At the Shortlands, the troops were again loaded into six destroyers next day, the 29th, and this time the 1,000 soldiers were successfully landed after dark at Taivu Point on the north-central shore of Guadalcanal. Additional reinforcement by Major General Seiken Kawaguchi's brigade, originally intended for Papua, was on the way from Truk. They arrived at Bougainville in late August, and the 1st Battalion was carried to Guadalcanal in three destroyers on the 30th. Eight destroyers brought in a one, 200-man contingent on the 31st. A third group was carried south by four destroyers on September 1st, but they were turned back by stiff air opposition. The next day, 20 Japanese fighter planes and 18 bombers pounded Guadalcanal, and the landing of the Kawaguchi Brigade was completed by a dozen destroyers on September 4th and 7th. During all these reinforcement operations, Amatsukaze was stuck frustratingly at Truk. I knew how to use destroyers in putting troops ashore. I also knew that soldiers landed from destroyers could carry only light arms. I brooded over the fact that our lightly equipped troops, in whatever numbers, were no match for the heavily armed Americans on Guadalcanal. Truk was quiet after the Kawaguchi convoy sailed. The calm of the harbour waters and the peace of the atoll were soothing to Amatsukaze's weary crew. My men were happy and took full advantage of our respite. The atoll abounded with fish of many varieties and every motorboat brought fresh fish back to the ship. This meant a great treat for men who had been living on tasteless canned food, and we all enjoyed our fill of sashimi, the thin strips of raw fish which are such a delicacy. The mainstay of the combined fleet ended ten days of fruitless roaming and entered Truk on September 5th. The spacious harbour shrank considerably when filled with these fifty-odd vessels headed by the 69 100-ton battleship Yamato. For three days, the skippers and commanders of the many fleet units met in the various flagships for detailed tactical conferences. The last meeting was held aboard Yamato with Admiral Yamamoto presiding. The preliminary discussions had dealt only with trivial matters. No one dreamed of contesting the basic operation formula already set. Criticism of basic concepts in the Imperial Navy would have impugned the top-level admirals and brought instant dismissal of the critic. Thus, all the preliminaries had been unproductive. Yamamoto was his taciturn self at the final conference. He cautioned against underestimating American fighting strength, and the session ended with the issuance of two simple instructions. Keep the location and movements of our carriers unknown to the enemy, and make initial air assaults against the enemy as strong as possible. I returned to my ship with empty heart, feeling that the conferences had achieved nothing. Lieutenant Shimizu met me unhappily at the ramp. What's the matter with you? I asked. We failed to catch a single fish today. This super fleet of ours has exterminated every fish in the atoll in just three days. On September 9th, the combined fleet steamed out of Truk Atoll with Amatsukaze back in its original position as part of the Nagumo Task Force. Our plan was for an all-out assault on Guadalcanal on September 12th in concert with an offensive by Kawaguchi's ground forces. Instead, however, we spent the night of the 12th awaiting word that the Guadalcanal airfields were in Japanese hands. We continued impatiently to wait all through the next day. Late that night, naval air headquarters at Rabaul radioed, According to our reconnaissance, the enemy airfields at Guadalcanal seem to be held by our forces. Early next morning, several scout planes from our force returned with full reports which completely refuted the Rabaul information. The long-awaited message from Kawaguchi reached us on the 15th, saying his troops had met stiff enemy opposition, sustained heavy losses, and were forced to abandon the airfields. We stamped our feet in bitter anger. In the afternoon of the same day, our patrol planes and submarines reported a large enemy task force of carriers and battleships 260 miles southeast of Guadalcanal. Lieutenant Commander Takaichi Kinashi, skipper of submarine I-19, in the first joyful message of that gloomy week, reported that he had torpedoed and sunk US carrier WASP. Our task force was ready and anxious to meet the enemy, but after roaming idly for a week our fuel ran low. We spent three days in fueling our ships some 200 miles north of Guadalcanal. Thus, our best chances for engaging the enemy at this time were lost. 
Meanwhile, Admiral Yamamoto finally decided that at least a full division of troops was needed to reinforce Guadalcanal. So, having wasted tremendous quantities of fuel without accomplishing a thing, the combined fleet turned back to Truk. At the same time, Yamamoto ordered Rear Admiral Kakuji Kakuta, then training three new carriers in home waters, to bring his ships to Truk as soon as possible. Yamamoto had decided to delay any further operation until after the arrival of Kakuta's second air fleet, and Kakuta did not get to Truk until October 9th. Thus, Japan lost two months of precious time following the enemy landing on Guadalcanal before the Imperial Navy was ready for a full-scale counter-offensive. In October 1942, Admiral Yamamoto's combined fleet was deployed for the first time in the manner of the Shuijan. Its head was the Nagumo Task Force, the body was Yamamoto's own battleship squadron, and the tail was the newly arrived ships under command of Admiral Kakuta. Nagumo's teeth were 29, 800-ton carriers, Zuikaku and Shokaku, which, fully armed and loaded, actually came to some 40,000 tons. Japan's foremost carriers, they boasted the best crews and pilots. They were supported by Kakuta's 27, 500-ton converted carriers, Hiyo, Junyo and 13, 100-ton Zuiho. These were manned by newly trained crewmen and flyers, but their inexperience was offset by Kakuta's fierce aggressiveness. He was the youngest of Yamamoto's flag-rank subordinates and a robust battler. He arrived at Truk, vengeful at the loss of carrier Ryujo, which he had once commanded. It had been sunk in the Battle of the Eastern Solomons mainly because of boners by the high command of the Japanese Navy. He was still angry about the Midway debacle, too, where he had commanded the second carrier striking force, which struck at the Aleutians. In that case, the tail was extended too far to permit it to strike back when the head was attacked. By October 1942, Imperial headquarters at Tokyo had awakened to the grave situation and authorised Yamamoto to concentrate on Guadalcanal and leave the Papuan operation as it stands. He was thus given a chance to be Sun Tse's skillful tactician, but he was not given a free hand in carrying out his chance. The army still held the initiative, the army brought its second division from Java to Rabul and requested a joint amphibious operation to Guadalcanal. The amphibious operation meant that the army supplied troops and arms. It was up to the navy to carry and support them. The army had half of all Japan's combat planes, but it did not offer a single one to this operation. The Japanese concept of a joint operation was quite different from that of the United States. When Guadalcanal landing operations were resumed, it was the famed Tokyo Express which carried the 2nd Division. These were ships of Rear Admiral Gunichi Mikawa's 8th Fleet at Rabaul. Rear Admiral Kakuji Kakuta's task force steamed out of Truk on October 10th to give air support to ground operations at the bitterly contested island. My ship and one other destroyer had left Truk the previous day to hit Ndeni, one of the northern islands in the Santa Cruz group, which we suspected of harbouring enemy flying boats. We arrived there only to find the island completely evacuated. We swung back north of the Solomons, and on October 15th joined the Nagumo Task Force, which had left Truk on the 11th. Mikawa's Tokyo Express landed the 10 600-man 2nd Army Division in eight trips between October 2nd and 11, practically without loss. The operation was a complete success. The Allies apparently recognised the Shuijan deployment and took a cautious stand. The only clash was on the night of October 11th between Rear Admiral Aritomo Goto's Cruiser Division 6 and Rear Admiral Norman Scott's Task Force 64. The Japanese escort group was ambushed by TF-64 in the narrow waters between Savo and Guadalcanal Islands, in what has since become known as the Battle of Cape Esperance. The American fleet of four cruisers and five destroyers had a numerical advantage over Japan's three cruisers and two destroyers. The furious fight ended with Japan losing cruisers Furutaka and Aoba. TF-64 suffered the loss of destroyer Duncan and destroyer Fahrenholt and cruisers Salt Lake City and Boise. This action was further costly to Japan in that Admiral Goto was killed, but the battle was valuable too, as it cleared the American fleet from the area. Vice Admiral Takeo Kurita was thus able to bring battleships Congo and Haruna close to the Guadalcanal coast on the night of October 13th for a point-blank bombardment of Henderson Field. 
This was Yamamoto's first departure from his previous policy of hoarding the battleships. In all the earlier operations, he had steadfastly refused to expose battleships at the fighting front. With air support available from a field just completed at the southern tip of Bougainville, Yamamoto gambled. The gamble paid off. At 23 on October 13th, the 227, 500-ton warships closed to within one mile of the coast and slowed to a leisurely 18 knots. Their 16 big guns hurled 918 incendiary shells onto the airfield, which burned for a full 24 hours. Japanese troops on the island were thrilled and encouraged by this spectacle and urged the Navy to repeat the show. Yamamoto obliged, and the next night Admiral Mikawa paralleled the coast in cruisers Chokai and Kinugasa and sprayed the airfield with 752 shells. But there were other chores for the Navy these days and nights, and an important one was the delivery of heavy arms to equip the troops. While such undertakings were in progress, the American task force worked its way back. The first effective American air attack hit on October 15th, when six Japanese transports were sunk or put out of action. Another devastating attack came on the 17th. Early that morning, two American destroyers carried out an audacious bombardment of supply dumps, setting them afire. Seven American bombers returned that afternoon and finished the job. The lack of motorized equipment for quickly moving landed cargo to places of safety thus cost the Japanese army dearly. Brave men cried in anguish at the sight of these precious dumps in flames. The American ships were spotted 110 miles south of Guadalcanal as they withdrew, but Kakuta's task force was 200 miles north of the island and so had no chance to engage them. When Yamamoto reinforced the area, the enemy acted precisely in the spirit enunciated by Sun Tse in the seventh chapter of his Analects. When fighting a powerful force, one must hit when its morale ebbs. A force's morale is keen when its sorties, gradually begins to flag, and ebbs as it is ready to return to camp. One should avoid a force while its morale is keen, and one should hit when its morale ebbs. The two Japanese naval forces had been in the waters of the Southern Solomons for more than a week without engaging any strong enemy force. Their initially high morale was waning. Meanwhile, we were waiting impatiently for an all-out offensive on Guadalcanal promised by the land troops for October 20th. The army had at Guadalcanal its second division, from Sendai in northern Honshu. This outfit had occupied Nanking during the China War. Its ruthlessness had won it notoriety in the much-exaggerated rape of that city. The division had an easy time invading Java, where it faced practically no opposition, but it failed completely to anticipate the rugged terrain and inclement weather of Guadalcanal. Now, with more than half of its newly landed equipment burned by the Americans, the army troops were fighting a truly uphill battle. Despite the urgency of the army's situation, the October 20th offensive was postponed repeatedly, while the Navy stamped its feet in disgust. Ominously for Japan, Admiral Kakuta's flagship carrier, Hiyo, suddenly developed engine trouble on October 22nd. Frantic efforts by her engineers failed to correct the difficulty. Her engines, originally designed for a merchant ship, were not capable of the acceleration needed for a carrier. Kakuta transferred his flag to Junyo and ordered Hiyo back to Truk. It returned there at its best speed of six knots. The stage was being set for an American onslaught against the Japanese Navy, as much as for land action on Guadalcanal. And now Kakuta's task force had only one carrier. Zuiho had been transferred earlier to the Nagumo task force. The Sansa snake was no longer lithe, and its tail had lost two-thirds of its original stingers. Fresh, eager American naval forces were ready to strike. In the late afternoon of October 24th, Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo sat grimly in his cabin in carrier Shokaku. He had aged visibly since the midway defeat. His hair was grey, his face sallow and deeply wrinkled. He stared at two pieces of paper. He had already read them dozens of times trying to puzzle out their meaning. One was a United Press story dated October 20th, saying that the United States Navy was preparing for a major sea and air battle in the South Pacific. Nagumo asked himself what this meant. Was it a trap? The enemy carriers have been missing for a week, Nagumo mumbled. What does this mean? He stood up and slowly paced the room. The aging admiral stopped short, smiled, 
and thought of Sun Tzu's advice that one should avoid engaging the enemy while his morale is keen, and one should strike when his morale ebbs. There was a knock at the door, and one of Nagumo's staff officers entered. Sir, Commander Toshitana Takada said as he saluted, radio men report they are suddenly getting great numbers of undecipherable messages, evidently from nearby enemy submarines and aircraft. Very well, Nagumo nodded. Inform every skipper that a major action is imminent. Spread the formation as soon as the ships are fueled. About the same time in Carrier Junyo, Rear Admiral Kakuji Kakuta was listening to a radio broadcast from Hawaii. The commentator was predicting a major sea and air battle soon near the Solomons. Kakuta had been considering two sheets of paper identical to those of Nagumo's. Kakuta snorted and turned to his air officer, Lieutenant Commander Masatake Okumiya. Well, what do you say, Masatake? This alert and intelligent little man, whose eyes sparkled from his impassive face, burned and scarred in an air crash several years earlier, cleared his throat and said quietly, Sir, October 27th is America's Navy Day. Kakuta, a burly battler, jumped to his feet and roared with laughter. Very good, very good. Let's hustle and prepare a nice Navy Day gift for those cocky Yanks. 